go through the scriptures and pick up the word and, and talk about the word and, and uh, see what these scriptures had for us that evening. Uh, of course, you know, when we go into a, a study at a, a home fellowship, we think, oh yeah, we're going to get, you know, through a whole chapter here, you know. But uh, before you know it, it's cut down and it's really in-depth and it was really sweet to be able to go through it. Um, so the Lord stopped us in our tracks in certain areas and it really did speak to us. But then um, I wasn't in Sunday's teaching, you know. Um, I missed it, you know, because I was upstairs teaching the youth. So I, um, I always listen to them online, you know. I, I, I love the fact that we record the teachings here at Calvary Chapel Life. And, uh, and specifically because it benefits me too, you know. I get to drive to places and it takes me two hours to get there in traffic, you know. So I get to hear a couple teachings or, or just one, you know. So I either listen to a Wednesday night if I missed it or a Sunday morning if I missed it, you know. So on Monday I was listening to the Word on my way to, to, uh, to, my, uh, to my work. And uh, it was on temptation, you know. On the fact that, you know, we're going to get tempted. There's all kinds of stuff that is going to come against our faith, you know. And uh, what are we to do against these assaults, you know. And uh, I like the fact that Jesus, our greatest example, you know what I mean, used the Word, you know what I mean, no matter how much the enemy try, try to come against him, you know, he always looked to the Word. And uh, even though he was, he was God, he was still a man here on earth, you know, and he didn't exercise his godly, you know, uh, power here to, you know, escape, you know, the temptation, you know. But rather he went through it, and, um, and it, took, it gave me great courage and... Um, and in that, uh, Luke chapter 17, and uh, we're going we're gonna to study those, but before we get there, Luke chapter 16 was a really sweet, sweet chapter as well because, you know, it's that, it's that account where, where Jesus is speaking about um, the rich man and, the, uh, the rich man and, the, and Lazarus, you know, the poor man at the, at the gates and how he, you know, suffered, you know what I mean? And, um, and the rich man, you know, was in... in uh, you know, in care. He just, you know, he was well taken care of, you know. But yet when the poor man died, he got carried away to the bosom of Abraham, which was the pretty much the holding compartment, I guess you could say, before Christ, you know. Or the saints went there and they would go and, and uh, they would be comforted by Abraham, you know. Um, not like heaven today. Jesus is ascended and we have heaven and we go immediately to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. But, um, but then he got carried away to Abraham's bosom while the, the, uh, the rich man got put into Hades, you know, the, the place of torment, you know. And uh, it says that he was well aware of what was going on. As a matter of fact, he, he remembered, you know, because uh, Abraham asked him, you know, remember that you, while you were alive, you had the good things, you know, and Lazarus didn't, you know. And uh, he goes, well... Send somebody to warn my brothers, you know. And uh, in that, he was... He, I'll, I'll read the account real quick, and then uh, we'll pray, and we'll get into chapter 17. It says, Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in torment in this flame. But Abraham uh, said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides this, all this, between us and you, there, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to, uh, from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment Abraham said to him they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said no father Abraham but if one goes to them from the dead they will repent but he said to him if they do not hear Moses and the prophets neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead I mean, that's powerful. That's a, a, a powerful account of the description of what it will be in torment. And it's something that we don't want no part of, no business with. 
uh, especially the believer that's given their lives to Christ, hey, we are going to, uh, to heaven immediately with the Lord. And, um, and, and here, um, you know, you look at this account and he says, he says, hey, you know, send uh, Lazarus that he can at least warn my brothers. You know, and he says, look, even if someone was to rise from the dead, you know, they won't believe. And obviously Jesus Christ has ri uh, risen from the dead. Um, and, and yet there's many people that don't believe, you know. They want to put their whole, uh, their faith, in, in something else. And uh, it's astounding to me that some people would make the false statement or ask the, the false question, how can a God of love send people to hell? You know? And when you think about that question, that's already starting off as a false, false question, right? A God, of love, a, God, a, a God of love does not send people to hell. You know? God has made every provision for people not to go to hell. You know? He sent his prophets. He sent um, uh, the, the, the scriptures. Yeah, ultimately, he sent, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Not just for our sins that we're saved, praise God, but for the sins of the world. You know? But there's something needed in that place of you know, realizing that there is a need for a Savior. And I think people have a really hard gulf fixed between them and, uh, and that that understanding. And sometimes we run into people like that that are very dogmatic and they say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to believe. They're already predetermined in themselves to say, I'm not going to believe. You know, even though you convince them, you show them scripture, you can look at the Bible and say it's infallible. There's no error in it. Uh, it's uh, uh, one. I heard a teaching this morning uh, by um, Brian Broderson and he was, um, he was having a, a really good uh, teaching on uh, defending the Bible, you know. In the Bible, the one proof that's built into the Word of God is prophecy, you know. Everything that Jesus Christ came to do here on this earth, almost 300 different prophecies were fulfilled during the time of Christ, you know. That, that was foretold way before that the time of Christ would come, you know. And, uh, and, and they were answered to a T. Now, the likelihood of all those things happening with uh, somebody just uh, out of thin air, you know, just a uh, coincidence. A lot of people like to say, well, that was a coincidence, you know. Um, it, it, there's no likelihood. It's like some crazy number, you know, and I don't know them all. But uh, I, I believe the Word of God. I believe what it says because not only is it proof that uh, prophecy can can have his own built-in pro uh, uh, proof that the Bible is uh, inerrant. It's the inspired word of God. We have um, prophecies that are going to come true, that are going to come to pass, you know, and we're waiting for that, uh, those times as well. And again, if Jesus batted a thousand, guess what he's going to do again? Okay. Bat another thousand, you know. <laughs> he's not, he's not going to strike out in any one of them. So I'm really thankful for the scriptures, that we can trust them, that we can know them, that our youth can study them, and uh, grab a hold of them and make their choice for Christ, you know. Um, nobody here, you know, shows a Bible down people's throats, you know. I don't, I don't know where people get that, uh, that, you know, I guess sometimes we could be pretty dogmatic about it because we don't want people to go to hell, you know. We're like um, those that are begging, hey, stop, you know, you're going to have to walk over me, you know. But, um, but yet people are going to be predetermined to, to make that choice as well. And that, what a sad thing. Uh, Jesus Christ makes every way possible for people to come to him. And uh, he says that for whosoever believes in me, you know, um, you know, will not perish, you know. So uh, why don't we pray and we'll get into chapter 17. Father God, I just thank you so much for this evening, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for having us here. Lord, I pray that you would uh, cool this room off. I pray, Father God, that you would uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And like uh, Willis said, Lord, that you would open up our hearts, Lord, to receive the implanted word of God. That it would produce something in us, Lord. That it would hit us right where we're at. And that it would uh, cause uh, growth to happen in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I titled tonight's um, teaching, Offenses Will Come. Offenses Will Come. Now... I'll, I'll, I'll explain that title to you as we go through the word. So let's read, start off reading in uh, chapter 17, verse 1 through uh, 
before to get us start, started. Then he said to, to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he would be thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay, now, we'll take, a, we'll take these scriptures. Now, as we go through this uh, chapter, you almost sort of see a, a bunch of different things, you know. But... Um, they are in good context. They're out, they are actually in, uh, in continuity with each other because uh, right off the bat, the Lord is looking at his disciples after he had a, a really in-depth discussion with the Pharisees, letting them know about, you know, and hopefully they would, they would hear the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, was here. It, he was in their midst. He was, he was among them. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And yet they missed out on the whole thing. And... Um, so they wouldn't believe, you know, even even though they saw the miracles and they saw those things. So so we know that faith isn't by seeing. Right. We know that faith comes by hearing the word of God. But it's not just something that we see. So. Um, so verse 17 says, then he said to his disciples, turning to them now, he says, it is it is impossible that no offenses should come. Look for us today, even. And, and for them, as he, he directed his attention toward them, he says, hey, it is impossible that no offenses should come. There's going to be offenses that are going to come against us. That's going to come against our faith. There's, look at these offenses as obstacles. Um, uh, let me back up. This, I, 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 um, I read this thing on Facebook, and uh, uh, it, was for, it was Forrest Gump, but you know how you can put a different tagline to, to what he said, you know, sort of change what, what he said? Well, this guy was saying... Um, Forrest Gump, you know that, that part where he says, and all of a sudden, one day, it just began to rain. You know, and rain came up from the earth, rain came up, you know, all this stuff. So, so he's, uh, he's explaining this whole thing. So on Facebook, they tagged him, and, and he's sort of looking all stout, you know. And uh, he says, and one day, people just began to get offended about everything, you know, <laughs> about everything. It seems like people just get offended about everything. But this is in particular... Uh, this is directed toward us, you know, that we are going to get offended, you know. And yes, you know, people do get offended when you say, hey, you know, Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. They get offended. Wait a minute. There's many gods, and all gods are the same. No, no, not all gods are the same. There's one true God. And it, well, that offends me, you know. People get offended by all kinds of different things. Well, you won't, you won't give me a, a, a license to marry, or you don't want to bake me a cake? I'm offended. All kinds of stuff people are getting offended for. Every little single thing in our society now, people just get offended. I'm offended. You just said that to me, I'm offended. And, um, but, but for the Christian, know that offenses will come. It's almost like that scripture that Jesus um, said, uh, in this world you will have tribulation. Remember that scripture, right? It almost sounds like that, right? He says, uh, no offenses, oh, it says, it is impossible that no offenses should come. It is impossible. We're not going to escape offenses. Things are going to come against our faith on a daily basis. Things that we battle with. Temptation. You know, since we've been uh, studying about temptation on Sunday mornings in James, you know, it is impossible to escape temptation. It almost seems like everywhere we go, we're tempted. You know, tempted to do this, I'm tempted to do that. Some are have a bent toward temptation in some area in certain areas, and we got to take all those those things to the Lord. But but know that it is impossible that we should go through this world without being offended, without having something come against your faith that would uh, try to wreck it, you know, try to put an obstacle there in 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 place so that you'll trip up, you know, and uh, it's hard enough try to live a Christian life in this world, you know without something tripping you up. But know that the enemy is against you. Know that the world is against you. And know that your own flesh is against you. You know? So I'm going to get offended by my own flesh. Oh man, I can't believe I did that. 
I cannot believe I, I fell into that thing again, Lord. Help me with that. Please. And God will give you, you know that God says that he'll give you a way of escape? You know, sometimes when, um, I, I always like to see that picture that when uh, something comes your way, uh, like um, uh, Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house and the, the gal tried to seduce him, you know, he bolted, you know, went out the front door and ran, you know. Um, that's the way I hope that we are as far as uh, you know, temptation in our lives. Let's bolt. Let's just get up and out of there, you know. Let's not, let's not entertain that stuff, you know. But yet we are tempted, you know. So let me read in James chapter 1 just to get a good, uh, good understanding of certain uh, things. And I know that you, this is familiar to you because you guys just went through it on Sundays. It says, but each one is tempted... James chapter 1, verse 14. No, let me, let me back up. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been proven, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Look, after we endure these things on this earth, temptation, battling it out, having victory over that stuff, eventually as the Lord gives us more and more strength, more and more faith, you know, know that we're going to receive the crown of life. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot tempt, tempt, uh, be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticements. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. So, you know, that's, a, that's an obstacle. That's an offense to us. You know what? It's something that's going to hinder our walk. You know? And uh, so it is impossible that offenses should, uh, that no offense should come. So expect it. But woe to him through whom they do come. Woe to who? Woe to him that does offend. You know? There are many people that will want to teach you something different than, um, than just simple faith in Jesus Christ. You know, um, sometimes people have made it really hard, even through, uh, um, even in the Pharisees' time, where they would, they would make it so impossible for people to enter in. Not only were not, they, they not allowing, they, they wouldn't go in themselves. Remember that scripture, it says, they wouldn't allow uh, themselves to go in, but they were hindering everybody else from going in. You know? by their teachings, by their dog, by their rituals, by their, their things, where it made it so hard for a believer, a, 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 a saint, a, a, a dear brother or sister, to come to God and say, God, I just, want to, I just want to believe you at your word. You know, you said you're coming. I believe it, you know. So it, was, uh, it, it is hard to know that people will do that, you know. They'll make it so impossible for people to understand the Word of God and say, well, I got some special doctrine that I'm going to teach you, you know. Be careful of all that stuff, you know. I don't believe in a new doctrine or special doctrine and all this kind of stuff. Uh-uh, you know. Um, it says in verse 2, It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck. Whoa! That's how the Lord's going to deal with false teachers, you know. There's many religions out there teaching a false teaching, you know? And not only that, but they're taking people away from their faith, you know, simple faith in Jesus Christ, you know? And, uh, and, and teaching some stuff that's just wacky. And he would be thrown into the sea, then, then that he would, should offend one of these little ones. Look, the Lord considers us little ones. The Lord considers us his own, you know? We're his children, you know, he's adopted us. And imagine if somebody were to come and try to knock you out, out of your, your, your walk with the Lord, you know, to, to hinder your walk, to stumble you, to put an offense in front of you, you know. And, um, and it, it's sad because, you know, uh, uh, the Lord's going to deal with those, those people harshly. It says that it would be better than that if a millstone were hung around their neck and they would be thrown into the sea than for one of these little ones to be offended. You remember when um, uh, Jesus uh, 
was teaching and uh, the parents brought their little kids to be blessed by the Lord. And the disciples were like, no, no, you know who read that? Uh, Dave Clark uh, Sr. read that on, on Sunday for our teachers, you know, and um, for our Sunday school teachers. And uh, it, it was pretty cool to hear it afresh because here they are trying to stop kids from coming to Jesus, you know. Could you imagine that picture? If you get it in front of you, you're like, wait a minute, that's not right, you know. But yet they, they were trying to stop the, oh, the teacher can't be bothered, you know. No, you could come to the Lord anytime, you know. Come to Jesus and ask him to help you in time of need. Come to Jesus in times that you feel dis, discouraged in your faith or broken or lost. Saying, ask, asking God the real question, Lord, do you exist? Are you there? Help me, you know. Um, I remember when I was first coming to Christ, uh, one of the first things that, um, that Pastor Paul actually encouraged me when he, um, he gave me a Bible and, and, um, and he says, every time you go into this book, into the, into the Bible, pray that God will reveal himself to you, you know? And I was like, whoa, am I going to open up the Bible and Jesus is going to appear or something, you know? No, it was every time that I went into the Word, I would see Jesus in the pages of Scripture, you know, and um, and that's near and dear to my heart because it, it brought me closer to Jesus. It didn't prevent me from coming to Jesus. It got me closer and closer. And then other believers around me, you know, they were like, hey, come on, man, the water's good. Let's keep on following the Lord, you know. So take heed to yourself um, that, you know, that one of these little ones don't stumble. But then it says right here in verse uh, 3, it says, look at that. It says, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. Well, wait a minute. So as I was reading these scriptures, uh, preparing for Friday night, um, this actually, you know, got a hold of me, you know. You know how when you read the Word of God or you're going to teach it, you know, sometimes it has to go through you first, you know. Are you learning it? And I learned this very valuable lesson here that um, take heed to yourself, you know. Are, are we being a stumbling block for anybody? In our walk, in our faith, in our liberties, in our saying, hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm free. I'm free in Christ, you know. But yet, are you making somebody else stumble, you know? Are you being dogmatic about something and, you know, you're, you're just not going to let it go? Or, you know, are you going to hold a grudge against somebody and tell them, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm, I don't want nothing to do with you, you know. And, um, and that's putting a stumbling block in somebody's way, you know. Many people have you know, gone away from, from Christ over the fact that they, they leave saying, oh, the church, you know, they're all hypocrites. Well, you know what, that's just an excuse. I, I, I don't believe in that, you know. Uh, I believe, yeah, there's a bunch of fallen people in churches. <laughs> Welcome to, you know, to church. We're all fallen, <laughs> you know. Guess what, you're going to be offended, you know. Don't let that hinder your walk, though. Don't let somebody come against you in such a way that, you see their lives, and all of a sudden you're, you're like, well, they're not living up to their, their end of the bargain or their standards, you know? So you know what? Oh, I can't believe in Jesus now. Wait a minute. Did you put faith in that guy or in Jesus? No, we place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in somebody that's going to, you know, fall, you know? And, uh, and many times that does happen, even in a church where a pastor falls, you know? I, um, I, I, I don't... I, I dread that, that, that if a pastor would fall in a church, the enemy has accomplished what he wanted to do, you know. And my, my prayer is for the congregation and for that pastor. Lord, restore them. Be with them. Strengthen them, Lord. Don't let anybody all go off all crazy and say, oh, I'm done with church and all these people, you know. Because anywhere they go, they take themselves with them too, you know. But people get offended. And people move on and they say, well, I wasn't loved there. Wait a minute. Did you love anybody there? Did you get in and, and, and work, you know, and, and, and you get down and dirty with them? You know, because that's what we're to do. So it says, take heed, lest you offend one of these little ones, but take heed to yourselves. So in our lives, let's take stock in our own life. This hit close to home. You want me to tell you how? In my home. Real close to home, huh? That's pretty close. The Lord spoke to me in the sense that I, you know, you guys know me from church, you know. Hi, God bless you, brother, you know. 
but my family knows me, knows how I am, knows what gets me, you know, mad, knows, knows, you know, everything about me, you know. Am I living a life that's pleasing to the Lord in front of my kids, you know, in front of my wife? Are, are, are they seeing something in me that's causing them to stumble, you know? It, it, I'm not talking about me being perfect. I can't be perfect, you know. But it, 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 are my actions, are the things that I do impacting the way they look at the Lord? You know? Hey, Dad, I, I thought you, you know, you X, Y, Z, you believe these things, you know? But yet you're doing something else. Whoa. You get all angry and upset, you know? What's going on? Shouldn't you just be cool? No, I'm going to lose it sometimes. But you know what? The Lord is, wants to deal with me in that, you know? Hey, allow, allow your, your wife to look at you in a way that she says, right on. That guy loves the Lord. Let me look, let me look to the Lord, but let me submit to my husband in a godly way, you know? Can your wife say that? Can the people around you say, right on, man, that, that guy's a good example. I'm going to... I'm going to follow him as he's following the Lord. Didn't Paul the Apostle say that? Paul the Apostle said, hey, look, imitate me or follow me as I follow the Lord. You know, as I imitate, imitate Christ. You know, that's powerful to say. That's somebody that says, hey, look, I'm sold out. I'm going to, you know, I, I, I'm going straight on to Jesus. And, and Paul the Apostle was tenacious about the fact that he loved Jesus. And he wanted everybody to know it. You know, but he lived a life that was consistent with his beliefs. He, he not only talked the talk, he walked the walk. You know, so are we walking the walk or are we hindering the growth of somebody's faith in our own lives, in our own homes? So it says, take heed. Whoa. All right. That's speaking to us, you guys. That was speaking to the disciples. So take heed of yourselves. See, we could be teaching something that's contrary to the Word of God in, in our own homes. And we don't want no part of that. Lord, help me. Help me to be the man that you called me to be. Help me to be the kind of dad you called me to be. Help me to be the kind of mom you called me to be. Let me be consistent in the things that I say and I do. Lord, please, I need your strength. I need your help. So it continues on. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. All right, so take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Uh, that simple. All right? You know, in a church body, there is a place for people that are, are, are people that need a good rebuking. And there should be some, uh, some people that, uh, that go around rebuking people. But not just like indiscriminately, I'm going to rebuke you, I'm going to... Not sin, you know, seekers, not sin, you know, fault finders, you know. Uh, a well-placed rebuke at a right time is like the right, right thing for a person's life to hear, you know. It's like, you see somebody sinning against you because it's causing you to stumble? Hey, brother, can you cut that out? <laughs> You're hindering my walk here, you know. I'm trying to walk here, man. You know, go like a, like a, what was that guy's day with the buggy eyes? Uh, uh, he did that movie when he went back to college. Oh, Rodney. Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, Rodney. You know, I'm trying to walk here, man, you know? Yeah, like, like Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> buggy eyes. Yeah, buggy eyes, dude. That's how I remember him. I remember my dad watching him when I was growing up. And um, you know what? Um, there's sometimes... Some people in the body of Christ need to be rebuked. <laughs> hey, cut that out. What you're doing is wrong. You're, you're going against what the Word of God is teaching us to do. Hey, you're, you're wandering off on your own stuff, man. Cut that out. Get back into the flock. Get back into the fellowship, you know. Hey, I haven't seen you in a couple of children. What's up? You know? You're not causing me to stumble, but I'm seeing that you're stumbling all over the place, man. Get back in church. That's a well-placed rebuke at a right time. Uh, and, uh, and, and it'll find a heart at a good... Sometimes, you know what? Uh, a rebuke doesn't... It's not always a, the, the best thing to take, you know? I've been rebuked. I've been rebuked a couple of times, maybe many a times. I don't want to remember all of the times. 
but they hurt. You know, when uh, somebody rebukes you, it, it cuts to the heart. <gasps> How dare you say that to me? Do you know who I am? You know, get all puffy, you know. No, don't, don't allow, you know. Um, there can be two responses to a, a, a well-placed rebuke, <laughs> you know. Not just somebody coming up to you saying, hey, man, your hair looks messed up, you know. <laughs> Not like that. A good rebuke, you know, you can have two responses to it. One is you can take that rebuke to the Lord and say, Lord, is this right? Is this from you? Did you mean to tell me this through my brother? I, I, know, I know you love me, Lord. And that dirty guy told me this, but I know that he loves me down the... But I'm still mad at him, you know? But you know what? Lord, is this from you? Pray about it. Ask the Lord. And change your way. Change your direction. Okay? The second response you could have to a rebuke is, how dare you? Huh. Tell me. Huh. I'm going to go off and leave you alone. I ain't going to have nothing to do with you. And that's it. You know? And uh, you never took that to heart. And then you go about your business and you're mad at the other guy for something you did. That's not a good response. Instead, take a good, well-placed rebuke in due season. Take it to the Lord and say, I want to I learn from this, Lord. Help me. Help me to... And then what does it say? It says then, uh, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. All right. We've done that. And if he repents, oh, okay. See, there's a change in direction right there. See, a, a rebuking is not always to just rebuke somebody for no discriminate reason. You know, I'm just going to discriminate against you, so I'm going to rebuke you. You know, rebuke, a, a good rebuke is always has the intention behind it that there's going to be restoration. That there's going to be a time of, of, of coming, hey, understanding what's going on here and, and repentance and forgiveness. The ultimate, you know, thing is there's going to be forgiveness there. So imagine somebody sitting against you. Somebody caused you harm. Somebody did something wrong to you. You rebuked them. You took it to them and said, hey, you know what, you did this, and I didn't appreciate it, you know. And then he looks at you and says, I'm sorry, forgive me. Then this is how that should work. Rebuke him, he repents, forgive him. Just like that. Oh, I forgive you, you know. It's like, um, it's like the story of the, um, the two little boys that were playing outside. Uh, we'll call them Billy and, and Mike. They were down the street. They were playing and they got into a scuffle, you know what I mean? They got into a brawl, little guys. Got into a little brawl with each other. Well, one of the kids got beat up pretty good. He went, ran home, went to his mom and says, Man, Mikey down the street just beat me up, Mom. I, I don't like that guy. I don't want nothing to do with him no more. I'm out of here. You know, goes in his room, gets his bandages all, you know, cleaned up. His mom heals him up, puts him in his room. There's a knock at the door. Mikey's at the door. And then, you know, Billy comes running out the room, bolting out the door again with Mikey. Before he goes out, his mom says, Hey, where are you going? I thought you didn't get along with this guy anymore, you know? Oh, Mom, it's okay. Me and, me and Mikey are really good forgetters, you know? We're really good forgetters. Are you a good forgetter in your life with people that have offended you, <laughs> that have caused any kind of harm to you? Or are you holding grudges? Because grudges aren't meant to be held. You know, you nurse a grudgy long enough, they get overgrown. You got a little baby grudgy, turns into a big grudgy, you know. Can't be feeding a little grudgy. So um, it's, an, it's impossible that offenses will come. But look, if you rebuke someone, they repent, forgive them. Just flat out, I forgive you. That's cool, brother. Let's keep going. Right on. Let's pick up where we left off, you know. If you can pick up right where you left off with somebody that has wronged you, that's a good thing. You have a really close heart with the Lord because you know what God has forgiven you of, you know, and uh, what God has forgiven me of. So I want to try to be a good forgetter in my life, you know. It says, verse 4, And if he sins against you seven times, wait a minute, seven times uh, in a day? Oh, Lord. And seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Oh, man, this is a lot harder. Now, <laughs> this, is, 
this is beyond us, you know. <laughs> Look, repentance and forgiveness go hand in hand. Okay? There cannot be forgiveness if somebody doesn't repent. Does the what? Did pastor just say that? What do you mean? So you mean I should be waiting for that guy to come and repent before I forgive him? No, that's not what I'm saying. Again, I'm not saying to hold on to a grudgy. You know? If somebody has wronged you and they don't come to you and ask you for forgiveness, you know? then it's probably better for you to just forgive anyways because it's going to be to your own good. You see what I mean, how that works? It's going to be to your own good. Ah, oh, I'll forgive them, Lord. Because the Bible does teach us that we should, make, uh, we should have forbearance for one another, right? We should have an allowance for one all. Oh, they're just falling just like I am. I understand that. But you know what? If you go to someone and you specifically tell them what they've done and they don't repent, how can you forgive? You're going to forgive on your side because you're going to say, hey, it's all good on my side. I've given them what I needed to give them. You know, now the Lord needs to handle that. That's beyond my control. I'm not going to mess around with that. Too many times we go through life and uh, disputes with family members, you know. Well, you know, you did this to me and I don't want to, you know, I told you what you did and, uh, and, and, and you didn't accept it. So I don't forgive you. So you hold on to a grudge for a long time. You, don't, you go through years without speaking to them. You know? That's a hard place to be. You know? Rather it be better that they would hear. But, you know, does the Lord forgive us outside of repentance? That's a good question, huh? Does, does God forgive if someone doesn't repent? No. If I live in my sin and I come to God and say, Hey God, thanks for Jesus. That's great. Me and Jesus are like this. But I never ask God to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me from my unrighteousness, to help me to change my direction and repent. Then how can forgiveness work? So likewise, you know, even in our own lives, we got to... We've got to see those situations all the way through. Allow God to work in, in both our hearts, you know. God, help me to be able to forgive. Help me to be able to accurately rebuke somebody and, and help them to repent. You know, but if that happens, even in our own lives, we should just take that forgiveness and say, thank you, brother, for forgiving me. You know, I, I wronged you. I brought this thing against you to trip you up. And you know what? I forgive you. <laughs> just like that. Instant. So, uh, but then he, again, back into the seven-day deal. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to hold on a minute on that because I'm still trying to process it in my mind. Are you? Seven days in that seven, in a day, seven times in one day. You know, you think by the second time you learned your lesson. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh-uh, I forgive you again. But then the Lord brings a hard thing against us. He says, and if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Wow. That is a hard thing to do. You guys want to see what the disciples responded? <laughs> Check this out. He says, verse 5, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. I'm undone. Ay, vey. Yeah. This is too hard for me. I think we're all in that camp. Seven times, you know, in, in the same day, I got to forgive this crummy dude. <laughs> Keeps on messing up. Yeah, you know what? We fall on, <laughs> on a repeated basis, you know. And, um, and it's a hard thing for, for us to, you know, to walk our walk, you know, sometimes. And, uh, but you know what? The Lord forgive, has forgiven us for so much, right? How many times in one day have we come to God? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Increase my faith then, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me those seven times. Because I messed up seven times. Might, might have been more like, you know, 30, 30 in the day. <laughs> but, but five, seven, you know. But Christ forgave us in that day. Gave us a brand new start, you know, in the morning and said, Lord, forgive me. 
help me to live a better life today than I did yesterday. And you know what? We're, we're always going to be in that camp. We're always going to be messing up. So the Lord gives us those areas where he says, come to me, confess your sins, and I am faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So if Jesus Christ can forgive us, but not only forgive, but forget, he's a good forgetter too, then we should be good forgivers and forgetters too. You see what I mean? But we still got to ask God for strength and faith. Oh Lord, this is hard. This is a hard, hard thing. This is not something easy. See, the Christian life, people think, oh, you, you believe in Jesus? Oh, it's hard. It's hard to be a Christian. I think it's the hardest life you can live because you got all kinds of stuff coming against your faith. Temptation, your flesh, the world, Satan, you know, obstacles, people doing you wrong, you know. All of the above, you know. But you know what? Lord, increase our faith. So then he says to them, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry bush, mulberry tree, be plant, be pulled up by the root and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. Whoa! I want that kind of faith, Lord. Give me that kind of faith. How can I forgive this guy? You know? then, Lord, I need faith. So he says, hey, look, if you had faith as a mustard seed. He doesn't say if you have faith like a mustard seed. Not, not a little bit of faith. It's good if you have a little bit of faith. That's okay. The Lord will meet you right there where you're at with that little bit of faith. But think about the, think about the, um, the mustard seed. It's like a flake. It's like a little tiny thing, right? I've never seen a, a, a mustard seed. I always wanted to. Matt, hook me up, brother. All right, show me. A, yeah, I, I want to see it. But I heard they're really, really small. But what happens to a mustard seed when you plant it? You, you put it in the ground. You cover it with dirt. I don't know how far down you got to put it in there. Probably not far. Yeah, so... Yeah, just poof. But to that little mustard seed, that's like, that's a Grand Canyon. How's it going to sprout up out of there? It's like a mountain, an obstacle, you know. Should he try to get up, you know, enough? Sometimes we do that with our faith, huh? Lord, give me faith. No. Faith. Faith as a mustard seed. Faith can grow. Look, it can grow past any obstacles that come, come against your faith. It can remove mountains. Those mountains that have come up against you that you say, oh, I can't. This is impossible, Lord. But with you, the Word of God says that all things are possible. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief, right? You take up all those scriptures and you start asking God, Help me to really increase my faith, Lord. Help me to be able to do these things that are impossible with man. But with you, all things are possible. So if you say to forgive that crummy guy, guess what? You're going to give me the faith and the strength to do it. So a mustard seed is so small, but yet it could grow up to be a, a, a pretty big plant, you know. And, uh, and I think about that in our faith. Faith is a choice. It is a choice. You know that you can choose to believe in Jesus Christ? If you're here tonight and you haven't chosen to believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then get that taken care of. It's a choice. Faith is a choice. Faith is also, did you guys know that faith is a gift? It's a gift. Jesus Christ gives out faith. Ask God, Lord, help me to believe in you. Help me to trust you, Lord. And God will give you faith. God will strengthen your faith. Maybe he'll strengthen your faith by going through some trial. You know? Oh, man. Whew. I went through that one, Lord. Thank you. You took me through that one. You know what? Next one come, Lord. I'm going to be ready because I know that I trusted in you in that one. I'm going to trust in you again. You're batting a thousand, I heard. 
You know, that preacher man said that. All them prophecies, you, you, you know. So if you're true and, and real, Lord, I know that you could do these things in my life, so I'm going to trust you. I'm just flat out going to trust you. Or have you been walking with the Lord for a, a, a long time in your faith walk that you could see the Lord working in your life? And when, when you look back, you're like, you know what? God was there in that time. God was there in that time. God was there in that time too. I remember that. Then that's your faith increasing and growing. See, the other thing that faith does, it does grow, right? You could mature in faith. Allow your faith to grow. You know? Um, what else? Faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what the Bible says. So as you spend time in Bible studies, guess what? Your faith is increasing. Your faith in Jesus Christ by the hearing of God's word. Maybe all the words that I say will fall on death, you know, all the extra stuff. But just the word of God that hits your heart tonight, that's the one thing that's going to increase your faith. I pray that happened tonight, you know, in your life. So, uh, Lord, increase my faith. You can say to this mulberry tree be pulled up and root, uprooted and planted into the sea and it will obey you and verse 7 and which of you having a servant now he goes into this this portion of scripture that almost sort of says what well, well, i thought we were talking about faith now we're talking about servants all right let's let's go with it let's just go with it verse 7 and which of you having a servant plowing or t or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field Come at once and sit down to, to eat, but with he will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drank, and afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he not thank the, the, does he thank the servant because he did these things which were commanded to him? So, wait a minute, what's going on here? So here's this, uh, um, this portion where the Lord brings in this illustration pretty much, you know, and says, look, which one of you having a servant? You're the master of the house, you know. Your servant's been out there tending sheep and working hard out in the field, you know. But when you get home, you want that servant in there to, you know, cook you the meal and get you the drink and everything? Are you going to tell that servant thank you? We'll see Jesus' response to this one. But you know what? A servant serves. That's my big theological uh, thing for tonight. If I could get anything across you. A servant serves. That's it. And does what the master asks him to do. So likewise, when the Lord asks us to do something, guess what we should do? We should just do it. Lord, I believe you. I trust in you. I'm sold out to you. You know, back then when, um, when uh, people were uh, indebted to someone, they can actually say, hey, I'm in debt to you. Um, hire me as one of your slaves, you know, and I'll pay off all my debt. And, uh, you know, uh, until I'm all paid up, you know. So they become a servant in that house, you know. And during that time, they're paying off their debt. They finally pay off their debt, but they're working hard to pay it off. Sort of like work, you know. Oh, man. I had all this debt. I had to go work till I could pay it off. Um, but you know what? When the boss says to do something, guess what you do? You do it. The boss is the boss, man. You know, otherwise what happens? You're going to be in the unemployment line real quick. You know what I mean? But you're fired, you know? But back then, they were servants and they were sold to them because, hey, you know what? For whatever reason. So here's a servant. Working hard in the field, got to come back in. Whew, I'm exhausted. Now I got to prepare dinner and I got to get this guy everything that he needs before I can sit down and have dinner. The, the, the master's not going to say, oh, you've been working so hard. Come on inside and let me, let me tend to you. That doesn't work that way, right? No. The servant comes in, serves the master, and after the master has drank and ate, then he eats and drinks. So likewise, you know, in our lives, we should just be just like that. It says, uh, Jesus says, the, he asks the questions and then he says, I think not. No, that guy's not going to get thanked for what he did. Why? 
Why doesn't he get thanked for what he did? Because that was what he was supposed to do anyways. That's what he was supposed to do anyways. Verse 10, so likewise you, oh, back to us, likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have, not, we have done what was our duty to do. We have just done what our duty was to do. So here's a big, here's a big one, right? The Lord commands us to forgive. Guess what we should do? Forgive. We shouldn't be like, oh, Lord, you see that? <laughs> I forgave that crummy guy. I don't ever deserve some points for that, you know? Or you're in service in the Lord in, in, in ministry and something. And, oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And look at all these people. I'm thankful. What's up with all these people? Lord, get them. Or Lord, didn't I do a good thing today? How come I don't get any credit or recognition? Can I get any respect? All right. <laughs> Anyways, no, no, you've only done what the master has asked you to do. What has the master asked us to do? Well, the master commands us to obey. He says, remember one of his commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. How about this one? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not a command. That, that's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. How about this one? Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Oh, Lord. These are hard ones. Ask the Lord for faith to increase it. So, in our lives, being a servant is what what should happen naturally. Look what happened in our lives. We came to the Lord. We asked Him, God, please have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm lost. All the things that I've done aren't working. Help me. Forgive me. And God says, I forgive you. Just like that. I forgive you. There's a repentance in your own heart that takes place. You turn to God and all of a sudden you become His servant. That is the highest position that you will get to as a Christian. That you're a servant of the Most High God. I count that an honor. You know? So, you're a servant of God, and now He gives you commandments. What are you going to do with them? You're going to obey them. You know? A servant serves. He does what his master calls him to do, even if they're hard. So, um... Let's go on here. Ooh. Okay, let's finish up. Then Jesus, almost like, what a coincidence that he's going to run into a, so the lepers here, right? But no, everything that Jesus did, everywhere that he went was a seek and save mission that he was here on earth to do. But it's almost like clockwork that this would come in. Uh, look in here. This is what happens in our lives when we give our lives to Christ. We become his servants but not out of, out of, oh, i got to obey what he says. You know what I mean? He's the master, I'm the servant. No. We do it out of a love relationship with Christ and what he's done in our lives. Like a bond servant, that's, that slave that sold himself to that master, eventually he pays off his debt. He likes it where he's at, and he says, hey, you know what? I want to be one of your servants. I want to be one of your bond servants by choice. Can I be one of your bond servants? Are you a bond servant of Jesus Christ tonight? Allow the Lord to increase your faith in those areas that you're like, I don't know if I can obey this one, Lord. Look at the ten lepers as an example and see how the Lord worked in their lives. Now, verse 11, It happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. That is, uh, that's asking for mercy. That's asking the Lord, help us. We need help, Lord. We've come to a place like that, right? Ma Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Listen to how the Lord responds. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. 
Jesus gives them, what happens right here? Jesus commanded them, right? What did he command them to do? Go and show yourself to the priest. But as they obeyed, as they did what God asked them to do, Jesus asked them to do, guess what happened? They were cleansed. That was pretty cool how the Lord did that, right? So they're cleansed as they're going. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, so there was a progression healing. I mean, they were walking all of a sudden. Oh, hey, we're going to go. That was their, the law they told them that they would have to go, if they were going to be cleansed as a leper, they were supposed to go show themselves to the priest. They were supposed to take two, uh, do, two uh, doves. They were going to uh, sacrifice one, run the blood in water, and then take another one, dip it in the uh, blood and water, and let it free. That was the offering for a leper. No time before this has, have, has leprosy been healed, except with um, Miriam, when Moses, you know, healed her and told her, hey, put your hand back in, and you know what I mean? You're going to have leper. And, ooh, comes up. That time, and the other time was with uh, Nahum, and that was uh, uh, a, a, a foreign king. I believe he comes to Elijah, I forget. And, um, and he's healed of leprosy. But in the Jewish uh, period here, there was no, nobody had ever come to the priest and said, I'm healed of leprosy. So this guy, these guys get healed of leprosy. They're going to the priest to show themselves. As they're going, they're getting healed. And one, it says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down at his feet, as his, at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He just came flat out and said, Lord, thank you. That should be our heart of gratitude in the fact that God has forgiven us. God has cleansed us, you know. And likewise, our lives will be a living testimony to people around us. Like those lepers, they went to go show themselves to the priest. Could you imagine? That was even supposed to be a sign to them. Oh, man. The Messiah must be here. Lepers are being cleansed. Never in our history have, has leprosy been cleansed and we had to do this. How do we do it again? We got to go back in Leviticus. Uh, okay, you take a dove, you, you know. They had to relearn that. But yet there were lepers coming in Cleansed because Jesus was healing them. Our lives should be a testimony to people around us that we've been forgiven. We've been forgiven. We've repented of our sins. We no longer live the way we used to. Now we live for Christ. He's living in us. Amen? Amen. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. God, help us. Give us faith, Lord, to believe the impossible. Help us to obey you when you say, Resist temptation and it will flee. You know, you don't have to run. Let it flee. You know? Help me, Lord, with the things that I struggle with in my own home. Help me to be the kind of man you called me to be. Increase my faith, Lord. Even though it's, a, it's a, you know, as a mustard seed, help it to grow even more, Lord. Help me with those things. Amen? Amen. I hope this was a good encouragement to us and, and uh, taking heed to what God says in, in our lives, you know, that maybe there's areas in our lives that we... We need a good rebuking, you know. Maybe rebuke yourself. Take, take heed to yourself, you know. The Bible says um, to, you know, bring those things before the Lord and say, God, change this area in me. Help me with this thing. Help me to cast it out. Help me to repent from it. Lord, help me to leave it behind. Help me to turn around and give it to you. And then allow the Lord to forgive you, you know. But then after that, be a good forgiver and forgetter of all kinds of stuff around you, you know? And allow people to see your life change from the inside out. To know that there's been a transformation that has taken place in your life. And then now you're just sold out for Christ. I'm a bond servant and I'm here to obey you, Lord. 
What are your orders from headquarters? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this evening, Lord. Thank you for having us together, Lord. I thank you so much for your scriptures, Lord, that, um, that say, Lord, that by hearing your word, Lord, our faith uh, will, will, will grow, Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray that we would take your word into our lives, into our homes, into our workplaces, Lord, and allow faith to grow in us. And Lord, I just thank you so much for forgiving us, Lord, for so many things, for so many things we've done today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're a good forgetter. Help us, Lord, to forgive people around us, Lord. Help us to be able to bring them into a good relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would also help us not to be a stumbling block to others, Lord. Even though we have freedoms, Lord, I pray that our freedoms wouldn't mean anything, Lord. Um, because, uh, because, Lord, we wouldn't want anybody else to stumble around us, Lord. We love you. Thank you for all you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.